Back at Gamescom in August, a new trailer for Stalker 2 was released called Bolts and Bullets. At the time I chose not to make a video about it for a few different reasons. However, now that I got to meet with the GSC Game World and play the Stalker 2 demo at Paris Games Week, I think it's finally time to make an analysis. If you only knew where I've just been and what I saw. In this video we will conduct an in-depth breakdown of this trailer, all while talking about my experience playing the demo. Indeed, both are closely related, since the Bolts and Bullets trailer seems to have been captured directly from the demo. We will also speculate and discuss some interesting theories. That being said, let's begin. When the trailer was released, GSC used a collection of words to introduce it to the audience. The words from this statement describe the scenes from the trailer and hold some significance that most people overlooked. Therefore, the chapters of this video shall be named after these words. If a scene had no words referencing it, I came up with my own. Door. Foretaste. The trailer opens with the usual GSC introduction. Both GSC and I seem to share an interest in doors, and for a good reason. A door that has not yet been opened is a thrilling opportunity. Who knows what you may find on the other side. As long as the door is closed, we can let our imagination go wild and theorize about what is to be discovered upon entry. The anticipation of the moment when we will walk through the door is the foretaste. In a more concrete way, the playable demo from which this trailer was captured is in itself a foretaste of the upcoming game for the people who had the chance to experience it. And what a taste. After playing through it, I can say that it felt just right. In my interview with the GSC, they confirmed that the version of the demo at Paris Games Week was improved compared to its earlier Gamescom counterpart, and it showed. While playing, I had no crashes, no performance issues, no bugs at all. Everything ran smoothly and as it should. More importantly, the game felt like the OG Stalker experience, and I am convinced it will be a worthy successor to the original trilogy. Bad. Tunnel. Steps. Strike. I was attacked while on a job. I got hit in the head. When I woke up, I was in almost nothing but my birthday suit. This was our first time listening to Skiff's English voiceover. I am guessing the words bad and strike refer to his first and second lines respectively. Things got bad when Skiff was attacked, and then he got struck in the head and passed out. The fact that he mentions being in a job when all of this happened is quite an interesting formulation. Perhaps it does not mean anything, yet it could be an indication that Skiff was not supposed to experience all of this. Maybe he was just doing a normal task, but everything went wrong, and that's how he ended up in the zone. But more on Skiff and what happened to him later on. The word tunnel is obviously referencing the location of the scene, which seems to be some sort of sewage contraption leading to a nearby river. There are many areas similar to this one in the zone, which we've seen before, for example the pipes from Yentar and Zaton. It also reminds me of this Stalker 2 engine screenshot, even though the two tunnels are quite different. Actually, there is the theory this location could be Dark Valley, with the bridge over the swamp and the small cliffs in the distance. This screenshot from Clear Sky seems to line up pretty well. However, there are some key differences, like the absence of power line in the original Dark Valley and the position of the north in the trailer which is slightly too far on the left side of the compass. Although, depending on the amount of reworking that GSC have done on the original locations, it still could be Dark Valley. 
On the other hand, all the next scenes in the trailer seem to have been taken from the demo, which I don't think is taking place in the Dark Valley. Unfortunately, I did not come across the spot of this scene while playing it, so the mystery remains for now. I don't have much to say about the word steps. I guess it refers to the first steps of the character in the trailer, which he takes towards the exit of the tunnel. Or maybe it is something else that I do not understand, who knows. From a more technical standpoint, this scene revealed the updated UI and quest indicators on the compass. We also see Skiff drawing his PMM pistol, which is loaded with 9 bullets. After testing it in the demo, I can confirm that it was possible to hide and draw your weapons just like in the previous games, and that weapons can have a bullet in the chamber. Ever since the Come To Me trailer, I have suspected this to be a thing, but now we know for sure that after you reload a weapon that still has a chambered bullet, this bullet will remain in the chamber. That's how you can have a PMM with 9 bullets, or an AK with 31 bullets, for example. Red. The next scene basks in red lighting, caused by an imminent emission. The player stands near the edge of a small cliff overlooking a village, which we now know is the location called Zalicia. This is a scene I experienced in the demo. You see, the playtime is around 15 minutes, and is enforced by the sudden appearance of an emission. Basically, the main objective of the demo is to reach Zalicia, and if you get there too soon or run out of time, the emission occurs. In order to survive and successfully complete the demo, the player is supposed to run to a hiding spot in the village, which is marked on the compass. We'll see it in more details later in the video. When I played, I received a message about the emission, I ran to the village and went through this exact spot jumped down the cliff and managed to reach the objective in time. In this scene, Skiff is equipped with the AKS-74 that could be acquired in the demo. And there are two interesting things to notice. The first is this strange electrical glow that looks like a moving anomaly. In the demo, I was able to see it up close because it is actually located right next to the main objective and despite what most thought, it was not really an anomaly. Instead, what I found was a light bulb connected to a cable, and both were emitting a large amount of electrical sparks. It is possible this was the device being affected by the zone and perhaps the emission, but I felt more like it was some sort of beacon, a visual signal to tell the player, and maybe other stalkers, where the safe spot to reach was located. The second thing is the wooden fence and gate along with the radioactive sign next to it. This arrangement is similar to the one seen in a famous stalker artwork that I'm sure you've guessed upon before. In the artwork, some of the famous generators could be seen. Of course, these did not appear in the demo, However, I have something to share about them nonetheless. When you get to play the demo, at the very beginning the game is sitting on the main menu, which we've seen in some photos. If you check out the options, the screen will show you the controls, and there's even a sheet with the controls on the desk next to your computer. In order to start the demo, you select play, but before it starts, there is a loading screen which kinda looks like this. Black stripes on top and bottom, with a large picture in the middle. Stalker 2 Heart of Chernobyl is written on top, and in the right bottom corner, there is some sort of gauge similar to those found on old Geiger counters, which had a needle that quickly goes from left to right, indicating that the game is loading. Once it is ready, an indication to press any button to continue will appear. From my own computer screen and the others that I was able to take a glimpse at, I saw four different loading screen images in total. 
there was this artwork with the form, another artwork called First Contact, and two others I had never seen before. One depicted Pripyat, you could see the top half of the ferris wheel along with buildings and rooftops behind it. The last one struck me the most, because it had some of the generators. Not those found in the final game, but instead the ones that were cut. The image had an angle similar to this, with the large anomalous trench-like formation and a generator at the end of it. You could see a second generator a bit to the left, but no more. So it did look a bit like the removed generator's location, but not exactly a perfect recreation either. Frankly, I'm not sure what to think of this. Just a random artwork, or actually a hint that the appearance of the generators from Shadow of Chernobyl and Clear Sky is going to be retconned? Or perhaps an entirely different location altogether? We'll see on release. Night Assault In this nighttime scene, the player is standing on the first floor of what appears to be an industrial building, looking at enemies closing in through a broken window. We know these are hostiles because they are marked red on the compass. It is a bit difficult to identify them, perhaps they are bandits. However, what we can notice is the use of headlamp flashlights to navigate in the dark. I must say that the player's flashlight was present in the demo. It functioned and looked just like in the original games. Furthermore, the new look of the bottom left corner UI was revealed. Most notably, the appearance of the radiation counter was updated. After playing the demo, I can confirm this location was featured and called the Boiler. It used to be occupied by stalkers, but bandits captured it, thus you are tasked to take it back. Although in the demo everything took place during daytime. We will actually see parts of the assault in some of the following scenes from the trailer. Here, Skiff holds the HK416, a weapon we've already seen before but never without the scope. During the demo, I was able to find the HK416 on a bandit I killed, though I did not use it. Basement Skiff finds himself in an underground location. He equips the HK416 with a scope on the go, adding it to the already existing foregrip attachment, then proceeds to open fire on something that can only be described as a strange phenomenon. At first glance, this could easily be mistaken for an anomaly, but if it was, it would not make much sense to shoot it. A quick look at the compass confirms our suspicion. This is actually a hostile entity that the player is fighting. Most likely this enemy is a form of poltergeist, a floating, almost invisible mutant gifted with telekinetic abilities. Indeed, the creature is forming some sort of shield made out of random debris to protect himself from incoming bullets. And we also see other objects being lifted in the room in preparation of the monster's counterattack. Besides, we can notice electrical sparks illuminating the room for an instant, which may be an indication of advanced interactions between the poltergeist and its environment. I actually experienced all of this while playing the demo, as I was able to find the entrance of this underground location and enter the poltergeist lair. Unfortunately, I was running out of time and I had no ammo left, so I could not fight properly. For some reason, I also met a hostile stalker in the basement, probably a bandit, so they teamed up against me and I died quite fast. Before that happened, though, the poltergeist lifted a bottle of vodka that was laying around and threw it at me. Knowing I was doomed, I decided to pick it up and drink it. That was a memorable moment. Now, about the location, do you remember the ribs arch anomaly? It was seen in screenshots and in the Come to Me trailer. 
Well, it turns out that the ribs was in the demo. And the entrance of the underground where the poltergeist is hiding was this door all along. In order to reach it, I had to cross the anomaly field which contained gravitational anomalies. In the demo you are equipped with the echo detector, and by using it I did spot an artifact inside, but for some reason I could not manage to retrieve it. Furthermore, at some point I stepped too close to an anomaly, probably either a vortex or a whirligig, and my character started to get sucked in. I quickly ran out of it, but still experienced its effect for a brief moment. It's kinda hard to describe, but basically while the anomaly pulls you in, there is a strong visual effect that distorts the screen as if it was quickly zooming in and out. It's definitely something new, so it surprised me, though it did fit the idea of being sucked in by a gravitational force. Speaking of anomalies... Anomalies. Bubbles. The next scene focuses on showcasing a brand new and quite interesting anomaly. At first it looks like a large floating bubble. It even has the diffraction effects sometimes seen on real-life soap bubbles. However, after throwing a bolt in the anomaly, it explodes, creating a myriad of much smaller bubbles that scatter around. Some even enter in contact with the player, removing some of the character's health. As a side note, this demonstrates that the UI is usually hidden, but it suddenly appears when needed. Then we see that the new bubbles can now be completely removed by throwing another bolt at them. All of this is quite a game changer, because in the previous entries, anomalies could never be removed. You had to find your way around them or use tricks to pass through, but they remained in place. Therefore, I believe this new bubble anomaly is a great addition to the roster of hazards in the zone, as it will bring more diversity to both the nature of anomalies and the ways to deal with them. It has been teased for a long time that Stalker 2 will feature many new anomalies as well as more interesting interactions to have with them, and this scene is a preview of exactly that. Sadly, I did not come across this new bubble anomaly in the demo. Seems like it was located in an abandoned house, and there were a lot of them in the demo. You see, I actually played the demo twice. The first time I followed the story and reached the emission shelter as intended. The second time I ignored the quest and just ran around trying to explore as many interesting areas as possible. After doing that, I can say that the playable map was quite large. It feels like there was so much more to see that I did not have the time to experience. Flesh Farm A flesh farm? The flesh is a classic mutant we already knew was coming back, and here we see two of them advancing towards the player who is reloading his double barrel shotgun in anticipation. It's a weapon I had the chance to use in the demo. A pretty nice gun to shoot. Just like in the Come to Me trailer, the buckshot shells are now blue, contrasting with their red color in the original games. All of it takes place in a farming building not unlike those we've met in the previous games. In fact, the entire scene reminds a lot of the time we fought our first fleshes at the abandoned farm in the cordon from Shadow of Chernobyl. The farm from the trailer was in the demo though, as I was able to find it when I played. The formulation, a flesh farm, instantly reminded me of this funny dialogue that happened in the Dark Valley in Shadow of Chernobyl, when Marked One asked the duty-er Bullet about the pig farm. Drooling for some pork chops already, huh? Heck, the zone is full of boars. Take a bite of one of those and you won't be needing a flashlight anymore. That's how bad you'll be glowing in the dark. Also, an interesting thing I noticed. Mutants appear as red markers on the visor just like human enemies. In the previous games, it was not the case. 
only humans showed up on the radar, with the exception of mutant pack leaders in clear sky. Despite not finding the bubble we discussed earlier, I did come across a brand new anomaly located in one of the buildings from the farm. You see, this scene shows the interior of one of the two farm buildings, which is inhabited by the fleshes. In the demo I also explored the second farm building, which was filled with a new kind of thermal anomaly. Each one was like a small reddish spot on the ground, which when triggered by a bolt or stepped upon, would spit fire in an arc. It looked like a classic burner but in the shape of an arc, kinda like a rainbow if you will, around 2 meters or 7 feet long I would say. The entire area around these anomalies was filled with a high temperature effect similar to the one seen in the previous games, where the screen goes red. Furthermore, I was able to detect an artifact within the building with my echo detector, but unfortunately I did not manage to retrieve it because I could not hear the beeping at all under the huge combined sounds of the incoming emission and the anomalies going on and off. Either way, it was very nice to see more variations in thermal anomalies. And I think we can expect the same for other types such as electrical and chemical anomalies. Stash While attaching a suppressor on the go, Skiff enters what seems to be an underground hideout, complete with furniture, makeshift beds, candles and so on. The roots coming down from the ceiling indicate the room wasn't dug very deep and probably in a wooded area. One object that particularly attracted my attention is this greenish yellowish device resting on a barrel. At first glance I thought it looked a bit like the artifact container lamp from the goodies contained in the Ultimate Physical Edition of the game. It also reminds me of this device held by a scientist. Maybe this strange box is actually an artifact container. I guess we'll learn the truth when the time comes. The pistol used here is a USP, called the UDP Compact in the games, which I was able to utilize in the demo. The suppressor itself has this worn, almost homemade vibe in its design that makes sense in the zone. By looking at it very closely, we can see that there is some sort of visual bug, where that suppressor suddenly changes textures right in the middle of the animation. I have no doubt this issue will be fixed, as the game is currently in the polishing phase. The fact that GSC decided to use the word stash to describe this scene makes me believe it might be something like the main character's personal base, similar to the way Strelok and his group had a secret place in the Agroprom underground. This also corroborates with the concept from the old now cancelled version of Stalker 2, in which the player was supposed to obtain his own underground hideout. Perhaps that's what it is, or I'm completely missing the point, who knows. In any case, I did not come across this location in the demo, but it is likely due to the fact I was far from exploring everything. For the same reason, I could not find any silencers or other weapon attachments, so I was not able to try them out. House Desolate This scene shows a dilapidated house that was cut in the middle, most likely by anomalous activity as we see a large rift in the ground similar to those created by powerful anomalous concentrations. Moreover, a gravitational anomaly is located right between the two separated parts of the building. Skiff enters the house while reloading his PMM, only to find his path blocked by that very anomaly. Thankfully he has a trick up his sleeve. By shooting a bucket inside the anomaly, it triggers, releasing its deadly shockwave, and giving our hero just enough time to jump across while the anomaly recharges. Even though the scene cuts right before we actually see the jump, it is clear that this was the player's intention, because Skiff starts running towards the gap. 
in the demo, I did find this exact house and even shot the bucket inside the anomaly to replicate the scene. However, I did not take the risk of jumping across, as I did not want to die, and instead continued to explore. The sequence showcases a few interesting things. Firstly, we see the updated Springboard, which shares the behavior with its Shadow of Chernobyl counterpart. Indeed, in Shadow of Chernobyl, the Springboard's shockwave could be triggered by throwing a bolt, but this was changed in Clear Sky and Call of Pripyat. In these later games, a bolt was not sufficient anymore, and tossing one in the springboard only produced a small distortion, the same seen in other gravitational anomalies being the Whirligig and the Vortex. I think this was a bad change, and I always preferred the Shadow of Chernobyl's version, because it made the springboard different from the Whirligig and the Vortex, and allowed for a more responsive environment when throwing bolts and interacting with gravitational anomalies. Thus, it is good seeing the old version of the springboard in Stalker 2. Secondly, the trick of using a bolt to discharge an anomaly and run through it did exist in the original games, but it could only be used for certain anomalies, most notably for electros. The trick did not really work that well on gravitational anomalies, however, it seems this will be tweaked in the upcoming game, and there is a good chance the bolt trick is going to be reliable in more situations, and therefore used more often than in the previous entries. Dogs, misfire, crap. Skiff is laying on the ground and a wild dog is biting on his leg. He tries to shoot at it with his PMM, Unfortunately, the gun misfires, and he lets out the words <coughs> right before the dog jumps at his neck. Instinctively, Skiff protects himself with his other arm, then pushes back the dog which is sucked inside a nearby gravitational anomaly. The monster is almost instantly torn to pieces. This scene is actually the opening sequence of the playable demo. At the beginning, you wake up in this exact position, the cutscene plays, and that's how the demo starts. Although, this is only the first part of the cutscene, we will see what happens next in a few. Besides, in the trailer, the scene was cut in order to be shorter. In the demo, the way Skiff struggles with the dog and shoves it back felt more natural than in Bolts and Bullets. During this scene, the entire compass is lit up in yellow, the same color which is used for marking the main quest objectives. Most likely, the compass will look this way whenever the player is engaged in his primary objective. Cars, bandits, bullets. In the six following short scenes, we see Skiff battling the bandits at the location of the boiler building. This is the area where the player was tasked to attack the bandits in the demo. I suppose GSC used the word cars to describe the area because there are quite a few vehicles parked in the yard, including a tank truck, a van, a tractor, and a flatbed truck. The models and designs of these vehicles are absolutely on point with what the veterans of the zone have come to expect. During the firefight, we can notice the quick buttons menu popping up in the UI. This is similar to the system from Call of Pripyat, which allowed us to bind four consumable items to the F1, F2, F3 and F4 keys for quick use in the middle of the action. We also see the addition of the firing mode under the ammunition UI. Some weapons, such as pistols, only have single-shot fire available, while others seem to have access to automatic or even burst fire modes. Though I am not sure if this even worked in the demo, as I did not figure out how to change firing modes. In terms of weapons, these scenes showcased a new optical accessory for the AKS-74U, a muffler for the AKS-74, and a rail add-on for the MP5 or Viper 5. Furthermore, we were showcased explosive barrels, which explode when the player shoots on it. 
This is a classic trope in shooter games, which actually did exist in the previous Stalker entries. Finally, in one scene we can see Skiff shooting from the building's roof. I did climb on this roof when playing the demo by using a ladder, and I can say there was a special animation when climbing it. My experience with this bandit fight in the demo was quite enjoyable. Taking on so many enemies alone is not that easy, but it felt just like the good old times of Shadow of Chernobyl. The bandits move around during the fight, react to the player's actions, and behave in a similar way to the previous games. They also shout a lot of combat phrases, all of them in English as far as I could tell. The only problem I had was the ammo. You don't have a lot of it in the demo, so I quickly ran out and had to resort to using the knife to finish the fight. That's right. The knife is back and still works the same as before. Left click for a slash and right click for a more powerful attack. I managed to kill three bandits using it, by closing in on them, running from cover to cover and finally rushing like a madman. It usually took two or three stabs to finish a bandit off. Moreover, the melee attacks from the NPCs are back as well thankfully much less effective than before. Nobody likes to get dunked on like that and not be able to do the same, so it seems GSC addressed this problem by both reducing the power of the enemy melee attack and giving the player the possibility to perform it as well. Indeed, in the demo you could melee attack by pressing the V key, resulting in Skiff using his weapon to strike in front of him. Oh, and by the way, leaning with the Q and E keys was possible in the demo. Bondage Following the firefight, Skiff utilizes a bandage to stop his bleeding. This was the first time we were shown the animation displayed when using the bandage. With the previous material, so far we've seen the animations for the medkit, energy drink and bandage. In the demo, I was also able to experience the animation for drinking a vodka. Something weird popping up in this scene is an arc displayed on the screen, which looks like a damage direction indicator, except it's white instead of red. Apparently, this is a detection indicator, which shows the direction of enemies prior to spotting you. It basically replaces the old system that had a bar fill up to show how close you were to being detected. Bolt. This scene takes place right after the dog's misfire crap sequence. After pushing the dog inside the anomaly, Skiff interacts with a friendly stalker called Richter, who tosses him a bolt. He says, Here's your bolt! And after catching it, Skiff replies, Where the hell would I need a bolt? Which goes to show that he must be quite new to the zone or so it seems. After this cutscene, the player is given control of Skiff and Richter instructs to use the bolt to trigger the nearby spring bolt and run through it as they recharge, exactly like we already discussed previously. By the way, I was right about the bolts. In my analysis of the Come to Me trailer, I suspected that bolts will have two different throwing animations depending on the mouse button used. Left click is a simple quick toss and right click is a charged throw, which you can hold to increase its strength just like in the original games. I could test it in the demo and it worked exactly like that. Anyway, after you managed to go through the springboard, you can climb the small hill from the other side and get face to face with Richter. That's where you get the first NPC dialogue of the demo, and I guess the whole game. There was no dialogue box with text anymore, everything was spoken directly by Richter, although it might have been because it's part of the main quest. When you are expected to talk, your dialogue options show up in the bottom of the screen, but there are no box either, it's just text on top of whatever your character is looking at. The chat with Richter was not very long. You had two different line options, 
which both led to the same result. Richter gives you a few medkits to deliver and tells you to go to Zelicia. The only interesting thing was that in one of the options, Skiff told Richter that he is looking for someone. He did not say who that is, but I have a theory, which I will explain a bit later. Dogs, again. Skiff reloads his AKS-74U equipped with double taped magazine, and then ah, crap. takes down the dogs charging at him. The double taped mag is an interesting addition which I am not surprised about, as it already appeared in many artworks from the original games. And weapons modifications in the zone are mostly made with improvised means. That's how the magazine capacity upgrades were described at least. While I did not find any such magazine in the demo, someone else who played told me that he did, and apparently the mag was an item that you could carry in your inventory. The location is a wooded area with some houses and a narrow road, typical of the kind of landscape that was present in the demo. It seems dogs were the primary mutant enemy encountered in the demo, as they were spread around the entire location. In fact, they are probably the first enemy that players fought. Indeed, after talking with Richter, you are supposed to go to a nearby house populated by stalkers to deliver the medkits he gave you. When you reach the area, it is under attack by a few dogs, so you help wiping them out before talking to one of the locals. Fighting the dogs was very similar to the originals, they run around you and attack with basically the same patterns. The guy you helped was called Zorik. You know, this guy. I said come in, don't stand there. Or at least someone with the same name. He also had a body on the floor, probably wounded. The dialogue with him worked the same way as with Richter. In short, Zorik thanked us, saying he unfortunately could not reward us because he was out of money, which he called coupons. There was an option for us to ask him for a better reward, but I did not choose that one. He further explained that they used to camp at the boiler building, but the bandits took it for themselves. Then Skiff basically says that he needs to blow some steam off, so he'll take care of the bandits, alone. Perhaps Skiff has a military background, or is just a crazy badass, who knows. That's how you get the quest to wipe out the bandits at the boiler. Overall, the voice acting was quite good, better than in the previous games, that's for sure. The facial animations looked also fine to me, although there was one short moment when I felt like it did not work properly. It's still work in progress after all. Flesh, again. Danger. Always. This looks like a continuation of the flesh farm, a flesh farm scene. However, this time it takes place at night. Skiff managed to kill one flesh but is now out of ammo and another flesh leaps at his face. The monster then starts to slash at the character with one of its forward legs, causing important damage. For me, this is one of the most striking scenes of the trailer, because in the previous games, the flesh was not a particularly dangerous enemy, being one of the weakest and most cowardly mutants. Now the flesh seems not only very aggressive, but it also looks absolutely terrifying. The fact that it gained the ability to quickly leap forward further increases the feelings. This, along with the description, danger always, might be a foreshadowing of the challenges we will encounter in Stalker 2. After playing the demo, I can say that even a veteran to the series will have to be wary at all times of his surroundings if he doesn't want to be lost to the zone. Rest, short, backpack. Here we see Skiff taking a short rest by injecting himself with medicine, the ending of the medkit animation, the very one we saw in the Come To Me trailer. At the same time, he walks towards a derelict car which contains a backpack. We then have a look at the looting screen, 
that has been slightly updated since its first and previous showcase in the Come to Me trailer. There are now buttons at the bottom of the screen which were not present before. The Take All, Drop and High Description keys are quite self-explanatory. The Auto Compare option is probably used to quickly see if a weapon you find is better than the one you currently have equipped. The most interesting one is the Equipment button. As it stands, the looting screen is incomplete as it lacks a large chunk of the player's inventory, containing the protective suit, weapons, artifacts and so on. The Equipment key is most likely used to access this part of the inventory. We can also notice that the carry weight limit is at 50 kilograms, just like in the previous games. On another note, the currency seen here is different from the one in the Come To Me trailer, as the logo has changed. That must be the coupons that Zorik mentioned being out of when he wished to reward Skiff. Last but not least, let's take a look at the items. We see some familiar icons such as ammunition and consumables, mainly the diet sausage, tourist delight, vodka, energy drink, bread, medkit and bandage. However, there are two items I could not identify, being an unknown food can and an unknown bottle. I once again did not find these items in the demo, probably because I focused way more on exploring than looting. Either way, it looks like we are getting more food variety in Stalker 2. Energy drink. Here's the energy drink consumption animation. The same we saw in the Become Non-Stoppable promotion video, except slightly faster. The area has trees, small cliffs and a bunch of gravitational anomalies, making the detector beep. I think this is a good time to talk about the inventory, which I was able to look at in the demo. Its appearance is very similar to the one from Call of Pripyat. You have a large grid of items on the right and all the equipment you are using in the middle. This section contains slots for the suit, headgear, two main weapons, a pistol, the anomaly detector and five artifacts. Thus, the suit plus headgear combination returns, as well as the artifact containers system. In the demo I was equipped with a leather jacket, no helmet, and with this, two of the five artifact slots were available. In addition, a new triple weapon loadout was implemented, composed of a primary gun, a secondary gun, and a pistol. Indeed, when I first played, I had the AKS-74U, the Son of Shotgun, and the PMM. When I played again, I had the Viper 5, double barrel hunting shotgun and UDP compact. In the previous games, the inventory only had two slots for equipped weapons, a primary gun and a pistol in both Shadow of Chernobyl and Clear Sky, and two weapons of any kind in Call of Pripyat. Thus, the prospect of a new system that still makes use of the pistol-specific slot while also maintaining the possibility to have two main weapons at the ready is interesting and makes a lot of sense. Under normal circumstances, the mouse wheel can be used to change weapons. However, before starting the demo, a dev told us that it was not going to work. For some reason, they removed it temporarily, so we had to resort to the keyboard numbers. One is for the knife, two for the pistol, three for the secondary weapon, four for the primary weapon, five for the grenades, six for the bolts, and seven for the detectors. The binoculars were nowhere to be seen. Now about the personal digital assistant. There is an animation for pulling the PDA out, and then it zooms on the screen and it becomes 2D like in the previous games. The device has several tabs, but only one was available in the demo, in which you could see your ongoing tasks. All the other functionalities could not be accessed, though their names were visible. 
These sections were the map, the journal, the notes, the upgrades, the stats, and the bestiary. The map tab is self-explanatory. Then there's both a journal tab and a notes tab. So I wonder how different they will be. Perhaps the journal will have entries written by the character, just like in Shadow of Chernobyl, while the notes section will allow the player to write in the PDA? Who knows? I guess the upgrades section will be used to keep track of all the different technicians and the upgrades they know how to perform. Or maybe it will be where the technical information found about upgrades will be stored, kinda like the flash drives from ClearSky. The statistics tabs is nothing new, it will probably keep track of the quests completed, number of stalkers and mutants killed, and so on, just like in the original trilogy. The bestiary is interesting, although I personally would have preferred a return of the encyclopedia from Shadow of Chernobyl. Indeed, a bestiary will only contain information about mutants and monsters, while an encyclopedia could hold data about basically everything in the zone. Anomalies and artifacts, locations, factions, and even legends told around the campfire. I still have hope something like this will be in the game, as everything shown in the demo is obviously subject to change during development. Danger. Invisible? Osh. Oh, Night time, another house in ruins. Skiff opens fire at a bloodsucker using the AKS 74U, this time equipped with a rail add on. The monster instantly turns on its optical camouflage as a defensive mechanism, and we can notice it disappears from the radar as it does so. From GSC's description of the scene, it seems our protagonist did not expect that and it's probably his first time fighting such a creature. He fails to take it down, and the Bloodsucker unleashes a leap strike, similar to the one that was revealed in the Come To Me trailer. Except now we do see the effect of the attack. Oh sh! Skiff must think as he falls to the ground, losing a large chunk of health and bleeding. That interaction is something brand new to the series. In the previous games, the monsters could never push you to the ground like this. Besides, both the Flesh and the Bloodsucker did not have such leap attacks. Some other mutants had similar abilities though. Pseudodogs, Chimeras, Snorks, and Swamp Bloodsuckers could jump quite long distances. Regardless, it is interesting and refreshing to see new attack patterns for the creatures of the zone as it will add variety in combat and lead to surprises even for veterans of the series. While playing the demo for the second time, I did encounter a bloodsucker, and let me tell you, that was a face-off I was not prepared for. The battle felt like a mini-boss. The monster was tough to kill, it moved around swiftly, used its optical camouflage well, and took quite a lot of punishment. Its attacks were also powerful, it had the usual claw slash as it runs past you, and sometimes the leap forward as seen in the trailer. I managed to dodge most of it, yet one time I was out of endurance so the bloodsucker hit me with its leap forward and knocked me down, just like in the trailer. Right afterwards, there is another short animation playing when Skiff gets back up on his feet, and the fighting continued. This new attack was clearly powerful, but it did not feel completely unfair either, as it is quite telegraphed, and even if you fail to dodge it, you can survive it and the monster does not finish you off when you are on the ground. All in all, the fight with the Bloodsucker was intense. It really offered me a challenge despite the fact that I have killed countless of them in the previous games. I believe that is a sign of how awesome the upcoming game is going to be. Moreover, some fans mentioned the fact that several bloodsuckers we've seen so far have all looked a bit different. 
there was one in the 2021 E3 gameplay trailer, one in the Come to Me trailer, and now one in the Boats and Bullets trailer. It is possible these differences can be attributed to the mutant subspecies concept that the devs promised for the game. Indeed, they revealed a long time ago that creatures living in different locations will have specific features and visual differences depending on their surrounding environment. For example, a bloodsucker living in the woods will be a bit different than a bloodsucker living underground. Definitely something I would keep an eye out for when the new monster designs are revealed. Before moving on, I'd like to mention a few more things about the weapons in both the trailer and the demo. Firstly, many have noticed the heavy smoke coming out of the weapon's barrels after firing. In the trailer, this effect was not consistent. In some scenes, it appears only after shooting a few rounds, while in other sequences it does not show up at all despite sustained fire. Therefore, we theorized that the intensity of the effect could be linked to the gun's condition with poorly maintained weapons overheating faster and smoking much more than a pristine shooter. I don't think I can say for sure from my experience of the demo, because I only used weapons that were in good condition. In fact, my guns never jammed when I played. However, I did notice that smoke was coming out of the barrels when I fired in long bursts. For example, after shooting almost an entire mag with the Viper 5 in full auto. Secondly, I saw that the character points the weapons up when getting too close to a wall. If you hug a wall with a gun out, Skiff will point the barrel upwards as to not drive it inside the wall. Rescue? Door! Skiff finds himself stuck outside during an emission. He bangs on the door of a shelter, begging for the stalkers inside to let him in. And thankfully his distress call is heard. As our protagonist starts to collapse under the effects of the blowout, a guy in a loner suit opens the door, grabs him and quickly pulls him inside. This is the small cutscene that played at the end of the demo if you managed to reach the mission shelter in time. In fact, the sequence was again cut a bit in the trailer, because in the demo, Skiff says Open the door! Open the door! Instead of just Door! Open the door! The entrance of the shelter is like a stairway to an underground cellar, similar to those located in the famous Rookie village at the Cordon. After this we get the classic Stalker 2 Heart of Chernobyl outro, as well as the reveal of the release window Q1 2024. The developers confirmed in the interview I made that the game is truly in the final phase and that they're working on polishing it. So I actually believe in Q1 2024. At the very end of the trailer, Skiff says something very interesting. I've got nowhere to go back to, Herman. Over and out. From the sound of it, Skiff is now stuck in the zone, and he contacts Herman via radio to inform him of the situation. Herman, of course, was a professor and leader of the scientific bunker established near Yanov Station in Kolov Pripyat. In the Under the Zone trailer, we saw a truck carrying Skiff inside the anomalous area, and fans were quick to point out that the driver looked a lot like Herman. I guess it is now pretty much confirmed that this character was indeed Herman, who will make a comeback as a scientist studying the zone, most likely working for the CIRCA, the scientific institute for research in the Chernobyl Anomalous area. It is also believed that the Enter the Zone trailer shows the opening sequence for the whole game, in which case we can try to connect the dots and form a coherent storyline. Here is my theory. Skiff might be a person who lost his home due to the recent events near the border of the zone. The radio from Herman's truck mentioned the following. The injured were evacuated. I remind our listeners that a similar incident happened in our region quite recently, 
ruining homes and livelihoods. However, city officials urge people to stay calm, assuring them the situation is totally under control. What if Skiff was among the victims? For some reason, perhaps as compensation, he was offered the job by the scientists of the Circa, and that's how he ended up going in the zone along with Herman and the Topaz device, which we know has something to do with anomalies. It looks like Skiff's mission was to carry the Topaz and use it. Unfortunately, something didn't go as planned. Skiff got separated from Herman, and later he was attacked, knocked unconscious and stripped of his valuable equipment and protective suit. It seems Herman somehow made it out alive, but Skiff remained stuck in the zone. He is helped by Richter who teaches him how to navigate through anomalies using bolts, and then the game truly starts. Herman must have been the person Skiff mentioned being looking for. After he reached Zelicia, Skiff was able to contact Herman via radio, informing him of the situation. This whole sequence of events would explain how Skiff found himself in the zone and why he is connected to the Circa, and thus to the Ward, which is the faction protecting the scientists. It does not explain, however, what kind of ties Skiff has to the monolith. On one hand, Skiff seems like a rookie to the zone. He does not know about the bolts, gets surprised by the bloodsucker, etc. On the other hand, he seems like a confident fighter, taking on bandit camps by himself, sharing his experience of the zone around the campfire, and most importantly, hanging out with monolith members. So the question remains, Skiff, who the fuck are you? Before wrapping up, I have a last theory I want to share. Many newcomers to the series are confused as to why the new entry is called Stalker 2, when there are already three games available. The usual answer is that the new game is separated from the old ones by a long time, both in terms of release date and in-game chronology. Thus, Stalker 2 is looking to be a brand new chapter in the series' history, be it due to its technical features setting it apart from its predecessors, or because it will depict a new part of the anomalous zone's history. While this response isn't wrong, I have something else in mind I like to add to my personal answer. You see, the name of the franchise is Stalker, with capital letters and with dots between the letters. This way of writing the world is not used to describe the people who trespass in the zone, who are called stalkers without capital letters and without the dots between the letters. Instead, what the game title refers to is the mark, or the tattoo, worn by the brainwashed agents of the sea consciousness. Stalker is a coded acronym, which we use to mark agents' program for particular mission. The only person we know of who was one such agent was the marked one, who turned out to be Strelok, and the original trilogy was basically centered around him and the ending of his quest to find out the secret behind the zone. Therefore, the number 2 being added after Stalker might indicate that we will now follow the story of a new agent, and if that's the case, you can bet this person will be Skiff. This would explain why he has ties to the monolith, but acts like a rookie at the beginning, since the brainwashing would have erased his memories. Perhaps Skiff was found in a similar state of distress as the marked one once was, and he was rescued by people of the Circa, who decided to keep him around, hence why he ended up working with Herman. Make sure to let me know what you think about this in the comments below. To conclude, the Bolts and Bullets trailer was made to showcase two gameplay aspects of the upcoming game. 
being dealing with anomalies, the bolts, and fighting with enemies, the bullets. As for the demo, it was a very strong showcase and a reassuring sight that the game is heading in the right direction. When I played it, I felt like a kid experiencing Shadow of Chernobyl for the first time again, and ever since that day, I've been craving to get my hands on Stalker 2. I really hope I'm right about this. I'm convinced the fans will not be disappointed. If you have a specific question about the demo, leave a comment and I'll do my best to answer. Thank you very much for watching until the end. And good hunting, Stalker.